Hey everybody, welcome to the Fired Up with CJ show. Today we have Connie Zweig here and we are talking about the, the inner work of a shifting from role to soul. What a fantastic subtitle. Um, so welcome, Connie. Hi, CJ. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm really excited about um, this work as I've been thinking about this. I don't know if I, I don't know if I qualify. I know I qualify for um, AARP as being an elder, but I don't know if I qualify generally. <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, I, I was talking to a friend of mine. I was like, well, you know, as an elder, she's like, you're not an elder yet. You, you, you have to be at least 65. So I thought, oh, I didn't realize there's an age in which you're supposed to become an, an, an elder. But in the book, you talk about um, being an elder. Um, and um, I was wondering if you can just explain what that role is. Um, and what it involves. Okay. So um, from my point of view, elder is a stage, not an age. Mm. And so we all have a Medicare birthday, we turn 65, and we're called seniors. But that doesn't mean that we've done any kind of inner work or given our gifts back to the world. Mm -hmm. It only means a chronological age. And so part of what I'm wanting to bring forward is that there is a new archetype, there is a new position for us that in indigenous cultures is revered, and carries tremendous respect, but in our ageist culture, it's really not looked at in that way. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean to become an elder? Well, we don't have a rite of passage for that. Like we have rites of passage in earlier stages of life. We, um, we don't have a psychological understanding of what it means. And we definitely don't have a spiritual framework for it. So people now, who are living very long lives for the first time in human history, right? The longevity revolution. We could have decades after retirement of good health and tremendous potential for our own development and for service to the common good. But there's no sort of organized way to become this or to do this in our culture. So I wrote this book really as a rite of passage to become an elder. It walks people through the steps, the understanding, and also the practices mm. so that by the end of the book, they've really completed a rite of passage to become an elder. And, um, you know, when I say elder is a stage, not an age, what I mean is, it's like water to ice. It's a major phase transition in who we are. Mm. Um, it's a developmental stage. Like we used to, you know, well, we still talk about childhood and adolescence and adulthood. Elderhood is a developmental stage. It doesn't even have a name yet. It's so neglected in our ages culture. So there's a lot more I can say about it, but that's kind of an introduction to the way okay. that I'm framing it in the book. All right. So I want to actually um, um, expand upon everything that you said. So it's a rite of passage, um, it, and that's part, part of what you um, map out in the book, in a developmental stage, which I assume means spiritually and um, psychologically. So can you help? elaborate in those two areas yes sure so for me as um, a depth psychologist it's really important for us to have some connection to the psyche or to the unconscious mind which Jung called the shadow mm -hmm. and that's what my career has been about that's what my earlier books meeting the shadow and romancing the shadow are about so to become an elder we need something um, larger than our ego to connect to. So for some people, that is the shadow, the unconscious. Maybe they follow their dreams. 
maybe in their creativity, they feel some spontaneous um, flow. Maybe um, they recognize that their unconscious is at work in certain behaviors. And so they begin to gather self-awareness about themselves. Why do I do that? Okay, now I understand um, this happened to me and this created this behavior. And so they have a certain quality of self-awareness. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. Secondly, they have um, some connection to something spiritual or transpersonal mm -hmm. or and whether we call it spirit or the universe or soul, I don't care what we call it, pure awareness, consciousness, they have Gaia, right? Because for people who are not spiritual and who are more material, it could be a connection to all of humanity and the planet. But whatever it is, it's a connection beyond our individuality. And the third thing is mortality awareness. And by that, I mean, they're not, an elder is not in denial of death. An elder is not denying that the time horizon has shortened, that it's now limited, and, and, they're, and they've broken through that kind of defense or denial against mort against death against mortality so those are three qualities that qualities of awareness that for me make up an elder's awareness hmm. um and we could add i think what happens when we cultivate those qualities of awareness is that this generosity arises in us and so we could add service some desire to contribute to create a legacy, to mentor, um, to engage in social justice issues. There are many elders now who are working on climate, working on racism, working on voting rights. And so that kind of naturally arises from this inner work. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing three things, self-awareness of um, I think the way that you're describing is self-awareness of what brings you passion, what brings you joy, what your dreams are. That is part of um, discovering um, your sacred work. Uh, there's moving in the Ken Wilber style from individuality to like transpersonal kind of identity. It's not just yes. me, it's me in the world. Yes. And then the other thing is, mm, changing perhaps the way that we think about not being in denial about death and kind right. of changing our relationship with death so um, death can be a teacher hmm. death waking up to our mortality as many people did during the pandemic can actually reduce our fear mm -hmm. and allow us to live more fully during this time because we recognize that we don't have infinite time. Mm -hmm. And regardless of what we believe about life after death, whatever we believe, this body, this individuality, my conniness will pass. Whatever, if I believe something lives on or I don't, this conniness will pass. And so that has really woken me up to what's most important for me now. Mm. my my priorities and values now mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so the um instead so recognizing that um that you are going to pass everything passes in buddhism they talk about impermanence nothing lasts forever even right. this moment is gone right now <laughs> okay so so it's it's basically um recognize moving away from fear of um death or fear of life is too short. Um, so if you were in denial about um, death, uh, then perhaps you can live life more fully. And how does one do that? Because it's like, okay, that's great. 
So Connie, how do I do that? How do you break through the denial? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, my career is writing about unconscious inner obstacles, mm -hmm. which we call shadows. Mm -hmm. So one of the shadows of age is the inner ageist. Mm -hmm. It's that part of us that worships youth. Mm and believes old is bad, young is good, old is bad. So it's the part of us that, that has internalized the collective ageism we live in. You know, the ageism that we see in our media, mm -hmm. um, that we experience in the healthcare system or in housing or in, you know, every sector of our world, there's a lot of ageism. Mm -hmm. So we internalize that in, in our families. I mean, my father used to make condescending comments. I internalized that. So, so I recognized at some point that I had an inner ageist and that I needed to work on that so that it was healed, so that it was no longer in charge internally mm -hmm. and that I could fully accept now that I have 72 years of life experience and it's a privilege. Mm -hmm. And it's an, it's an incredible gift to live that long. Whereas before, 10 years ago, I was starting to feel badly about my appearance, worried about my wrinkles, kind of watching all these, this anti-ageist messaging on television and, you know, kind of wondering what I could do about it. And when I recognized that, that there was a kind, and I heard it in my clients. You know, I was a psychotherapist for 35 years. So what I was hearing was um, shame, even self-hatred mm. about people who were slowing down, mm. losing their productivity, um, cha changing appearance, um, becoming a bit dependent. I was hearing self-hatred. Mm. And so when we work with that inner ageist, we come to see um, the beauty and the possibilities of this stage of life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because... It's, not a, it's not a simple quick fix. All right, so let's actually go through um, this whole idea of um, I'm, you're talking about, let's just map out some of these things and kind of help people do a reframe, right? So um, I definitely heard the old is bad, young is good to I have wisdom. I have 70 whatever years of wisdom. And then how about the appearance? What do you say? What is the way to reframe that in your mind? I know it will vary per person, but what, how have you come to understand that differently? Well, it is very different with people. And I think it has some differences with men and women also. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's an acceptance that I've come to that the body changes naturally, mm -hmm. depending on genetics. So with my genetics, I have a lot of wrinkles. With other people, they don't with some people gain weight because the metabolism slows down. Some people start to walk differently, their gait changes. Mm. Um, some people, their hair turns gray and other people they don't. So I don't have judgment about people who wanna dye their hair or even people who wanna get a facelift. That's not the point. The point is, coming to terms with or accepting ourselves more deeply underneath our appearance. So that's the shift from role to soul. Mm. The shift is from what we do and what we look like to our essential spiritual nature, our spiritual identities, which are behind and beneath all that other stuff. And as we do the inner work of age, we can make that shift in identity and come to experience who we really are, maybe for the first time. Yeah. Well, I, one of the things that I've noticed is that 
um, it seems like people, the way that they appear is a reflection of their insides. So there are some people who could be, you know, much older and have wrinkles, but their inner light shines through their face. And so yes. there's a sense of beauty and serenity, serenity that is more beautiful than someone who has their face lifted or which is maybe aesthetically more appealing than the wrinkled person with the bright blue eyes or whatever is coming through. And so um, it's not just your, and if you decide to have a facelift and still have an inner light, that's, you know, fine, <laughs> whatever you choose or want. Um, so I, I definitely hear the appearance part. And um, I like the, um, the idea of reframing. It's not what we do or what we look like it's um it's our soul and what shines through from the inside yeah and it's not just a reframe it's a real shift in our identity and our awareness you know you spoke about ken wilbur mm -hmm. it's a leap to another stage of awareness and what we're unconsciously identifying with as the self mm -hmm. If we continue to identify with our doing and our image, we're gonna be in trouble. Uh, that's one of the things that I've noticed at least with, I, I don't know um, why or how, but I've always had friends that are like 20, 30 years older than me. Like some uh -huh. of my best friends are 85, you know? Uh -huh. I don't uh -huh. know why, uh -huh. but, but um, one of the things that, um, I have been working on mostly because I see my older friends struggling with is the doing piece. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they were identified by the work that they did before. And mm -hmm. without that sense of doing somehow their life doesn't mean anything. That's right. So the whole slowing down the productivity, um, how can, how can people shift from world to soul in that way? How have you, what have you noticed and how can people shift internally to a better place? So the book is filled with practices for this rite of passage or this shift in awareness, right? So um, for example, you can learn how to do a life review. And as you begin to see both your lived life, the ego's life review, and your unlived life in the shadow, what was buried and not expressed. And as you begin to see the fullness of your story, you begin to get a sense that you were never in control. Mm -hmm. All these things unfolded in a way that we could never have planned. You know, maybe a trauma opened a door to therapy and that changed your life. Or maybe the end of a relationship opened another door and something magical unfolded. So we begin to see through the life review that the ego was not in charge mm -hmm. and that we were not what we were doing all along, mm. that, that we were carried by something larger. Uh, okay. And then there's a lot of, there are a lot of spiritual practices in the book from various traditions. And so if you begin to learn how to do meditation from your lineage, whatever resonates with you, I don't advocate a particular type of practice, but if you begin to learn how to meditate and see how the mind works and learn to quiet the mind, and sit in silence or pure awareness, whatever we call it, connecting with spirit or connecting with soul, doesn't matter the language. As we cultivate that, we recognize that we are not the body and we are not the thoughts. Mm -hmm. We are something else that's been hidden all this time by our empire building and our striving and our um, our other values, you know, building financial security, building family, building career. 
And that behind and beneath all of that is our essence. And you know, some people will call it God, some will call it spirit, some will call it higher self. But if we learn a meditation practice, we begin to experience that. So it's not a reframe in ideas. It's not a cognitive shift. It's an experiential shift mm -hmm. in awareness. Mm -hmm. And you come to realize, I'm not who I thought I was all this time. And so for people in their 80s, like you're describing, um, there's very little guidance in our culture for making a spiritual connection, especially in the context of impending death, as we were saying, right? But when could it be more important? Mm -hmm. And every spiritual and religious tradition teaches that this stage of life is for self-reflection and contemplation. Mm -hmm. That's what it's for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's, it's, um... It's funny when we, we were in China, uh, we were talking to um, Taoists, and they were saying that they don't like to teach you know young people in their twenties Taoism because they said if when that happens it reduces all motivation like they don't even live a life a full life because they've already just jumped directly to <laughs> to their eighties and so they don't have this whole rich life experience that a couple. A, accompanies that which is i think aspect of wisdom so you know you can't really get wisdom if you don't live a life and experience the if you kind of fast forward into understanding that you're one with everything you become non-dual and you become transpersonal i think um uh it was interesting when they said that because i thought well why don't they teach them younger but it, it was interesting i don't know what how i feel about that good or bad but it was just what they said and i thought it well, was interesting you know it reminds me of a story about joseph campbell the great mythologist the hero's journey mm -hmm. some young people came to him who had a guru and they said you know we have our guru we're going beyond the ego we don't have to follow the hero's journey mm -hmm. mm. and he said well that's fine but you'll miss out on life yeah <laughs> you know you'll miss out on a whole living a life so yeah. it, the ego is not the enemy it's not bad we need it to be socialized and to build our lives mm -hmm. but in later life the purpose is not to keep expanding and aggrandizing the ego mm. the purpose is not about our accomplishments anymore it's really about relativizing the ego through spiritual experience, mm -hmm. through the direct experience of connecting to something greater. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, well, I think that, I mean, the interesting thing, and I think also what I'm understanding about my own experience, whether I am an elder or not, a lot of these things I feel like I have kind of gone through um, is that there is getting to the transpersonal where you can feel the CJ-ness of everything to the ancestors of CJ, to Seattle, Washington, to the world, to feeling life events like, you know, <laughs> Kentucky. I mean, you start feeling everything, right? Yes. So you be, when you become one with everything, I think it's, it's, um, it's a beautiful and wonderful thing. And it's a really hard thing because I think if you're not, when I'm realizing myself, if you're not anchored into your individuality and have a healthy ego development beforehand, you could get very lost in this. If, if you get so big, it's very confusing. I don't even know sometimes when things are happening, I'm sitting in meditation and I'm crying there's nothing happening in CJ's life to constitute crying that I understand, but I, and I don't even understand what's happening, but being able to hold the whole and then also the individual, I think is really important. So how does one get clear with their purpose and mission and how does that change over time? 
so that they're anchored both in this transpersonal, but then also very personal. Well, it reminds me of the, the old saying, you have to be somebody to become nobody. Yeah, that's a good so one, yeah. if so, it is about being rooted as our consciousness expands and expands or grounded is a different metaphor. And, you know, in meditation, different things can happen that are about um, unstressing or unloading or purification. In India, it was called purification. And so you, we might cry without having any idea why we're crying. And that's okay because we're letting go of something that was lodged in us, that was stored up, that we couldn't release until we slowed down and became still, right? That's not gonna bubble up, like, let's just call it sorrow or compassion. It's not gonna bubble up while we're running around with our to-do list. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes when we sit and we get still, those buried feelings may come up. I had someone just tell me she's been really angry in meditation. Mm. So same thing. She's purifying from some anger that hadn't been expressed. Yeah. Um, so that's not a bad thing. Um, I think that what you're mm. saying about um, connecting to the collective humanity and the tremendous amount of suffering that's, that's happening right now um, on every level, almost on every single level, um, it's really painful. And I think it's really important for us to monitor how much of that we take in. Mm -hmm. So I've decided over the holiday, I'm gonna go on a news fast. Mm -hmm. Because I need to make some boundaries right now so that I'm not feeling that suffering so much that you're describing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean I'm going to cut off or become blinded to it, but I am going to take a break and give mm -hmm. myself some boundaries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so it's kind of individual, like becoming an individual as well like if i if i'm just boundary you know because part of what you're saying in as the three aspects one is to become transpersonal but it's also to have boundaries with the transpersonal aspect because it can be i think overwhelming and what i don't want to lose is one of the things that you talked about is your purpose and mission and how you know when you're younger you have a purpose and mission and when you're older um, that purpose and mission may change. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what that meant and um, how we navigate that. Okay. So one of the things I saw doing my life review, which is explained in the book, is that um, my ego's purpose was different from my soul's mission. Mm hmm and when I looked at my four distinct careers, they all looked really different. Mm -hmm. My ego really thrived. I mean, I've had a very privileged life. And at the same time, I saw that what united my four different careers was my soul's mission, mm -hmm. which is transmitting information about consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that that united everything I've cared about, everything I've done, everything I've taught, everything I've um, shared. And when I saw that, it was really deeply gratifying. It was like the thread of the tapestry that just pulled the image together, mm. the central thread of the tapestry. Yeah. So Different people have different ways of identifying their soul's mission. Um, you know, the life review is one way, but there are other ways to do that. And I think in this time, um, 
in the later years, that may change for people. Mm -hmm. So like I said, I know many older adults now who are working on climate change mm -hmm. and on voting rights. And they may not have been politically active before, but they can see the threats you know, to the planet and to democracy. And they are mentoring kids and giving their gifts and being really engaged. Mm -hmm. So um, our purpose can change in different stages of life. I don't know if everybody has the same soul's mission all throughout. I have no idea. It's that's kind of the Tao. You know, I feel like that's the Tao that was carrying me through this life. Mm. And the epilogue to the book is a letter to the grandchildren, the future generations about how they can find purpose, mm -hmm. how they can connect with, you know, a good life through finding a mission for themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny, I, um, my husband and I were sharing a conversation about um, what are the major events in your life which helped you understand what the world was about. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I was sharing, as a proxy for life review, uh -huh. um, I've also had, um, I'm not sure why, but I felt tempted to talk about the, um, the stories that you loved when you were a little kid, uh -huh. right? Because these are the hero's journey that you talk about. And, mm -hmm. you know, my favorite story was Cinderella. Mm -hmm who who thinks that she's this poor servant girl and then mm -hmm. you know it's like just a lovely person all these people shat upon her mm -hmm. but she realizes that she's actually a beautiful princess on the inside and finally yes. the inside and the outside match and yes so it's fundamentally a story about transformation mm -hmm. and um so i think i can look at that and go oh my life my soul's mission is about transformation. It's just, mm -hmm. it's from a very early age. Mm -hmm. I kind I knew, you know, I mean, I think it's mm -hmm. interesting. So that's like a very simplistic way. And uh, then my husband was talking about, so what are those major milestones in your life where you kind of understood what the world was all about at that mm -hmm. point? Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, the overarching arc of it is being a first generation Chinese person mm. and being having to navigate my Eastern culture and my Western culture and constantly feeling like I never really fit in anywhere. And so I had to make my own cult, in some ways, my own version of, of yes. what it was because I, I didn't really fit the, the types the you know conditioned understanding about what it meant to be either of these two things yes. so I had to find my place in the middle and so you know it, my whole life navigates around you know understanding like how do I be a popular western girl well I have to join yeah. a sorority right and then I have to act a certain way right. I don't like when I'm that way <laughs> so <laughs> threw that away okay right. well how do I be a powerful man then because i don't know if i like how be being a powerful woman in, yes, in the western culture I and then you. i became a man and i thought i don't like being a western man <laughs> either yeah. and then and, and then it's like constantly navigating the tension between what is expected of you mm -hmm. and what you truly want to do and mm -hmm. and I, I didn't realize until telling my whole life review story that that had been the tension i've been finding my entire life mm -hmm. literally mm -hmm. my entire life mm -hmm. and so and not surprisingly the stuff I'm working on right now is helping people find um, the traumatic and their events in their life that have created a sense of defense armoring and not mm -hmm. really showing up in life mm -hmm. so because that's what happened to me yeah so it's, it's it's interesting just thinking about um, and so I don't know if for yourself and you're talking about when you look at the through line through your work, it was, you know, you can look at those four chapters of your mm -hmm. life and say, it's all about consciousness, mm -hmm. increasing consciousness. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think so, for some people it's like that. And for some people, it's not like when I've right. interviewed people, sometimes I've interviewed guests where 
they're older and they said, I just realized that I want to start a vineyard. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I used to be a corporate executive. I ran right. off of, and I just want to run a vineyard. Right. Or, you know, it's just something right. like, it feels almost orthogonal, but mm-hmm. it's finally like I did what I was supposed to do. Right. Now I can finally do what I want to do. Yeah. So in some ways that pivot from seems to happen with the talk, the, what you described is the self-awareness of what you really find joy in and finally giving that to yourself. Yes. Allowing these buried dreams to come to the surface and be lived. Mm -hmm. And they could be about creativity my friend Phil has waited his whole life to write his novel in his 70s. I mean, they can be about um, starting a business. They can be about service. They can be about spirituality. All those dreams that were delayed. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes we even lost awareness of them because mm-hmm. they were buried so deeply. So for some people, and another thing is relational. You know, some people want this time to give and receive forgiveness Mm. and mend relationships before Mm. they die. Mm. And so that's a really central part of it as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And asking ourselves the question, if I don't do this, will I die with regret? And so that the, the this could be anything, right? It could be a yeah. small thing. It could be expressing a feeling. Yeah. It could be saying, I love you to someone you've never said, or I feel gratitude to someone you've never said, you know? Mm-hmm. So it could be a small thing and it could be a real change of life, like the man with the vineyard. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that I've interviewed um, quite a few guests this is um this topic is something that has fascinated me because i've seen because i have older friends and i've wondered what can i do now to prevent (laughs) because i'm a planner yeah that i've always been a planner so i thought well what can i do now to position myself into an ease easeful flow yeah into the elder parts of my life and um and the whole relationship review is so critical and i I, um, the shamanic indigenous work has some beautiful work that you can do, um, even as simple as writing, you know, saying forgiveness poems, or I ended up tracking down someone who I was an awful person when I went on a date with, and I said, I don't know if you remember, but this actually kind of has a little scar on my soul, so I really have to apologize for the way that I did this, and he's like, I don't even remember, (laughs) I thought, okay, good. That's okay. Good. You did yeah, it for that's yourself. That's okay, but I did it. I did it for me. Yeah, and that's, that's good. But those yeah. kinds of things, that's you know, right. my, you know, I think a, a lot of the reasons that have shaped my existence is my dad died at um, sixty-five, so he was waiting until he retired to finally do what he wanted to do. Aww. And literally, he was writing the last chapter of his book, and he died before oh, writing the last I'm chapter sorry. of his book. But it was so. Um, thank you. It's 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 actually been incredible pain, but incredible gift because when that happened, I comp- I shifted. It fundamentally shifted the way that I live to not wait until I was sixty five. Yes. Good. before I was pursuing my dreams because look what happened to my dad he waited yeah. till he was 65 to finally be creative and write that book yeah and he died yeah, yeah. A lot, died before you know so why yeah. postpone your dreams and self-awareness this could be something you don't have to wait until you're 65 to do frankly I mean it's something that um Maybe that was in your epilogue to your, um, in the epilogue of how we can live with purpose. Cause it's so, you can do it right now, right? I mean, do it right now. Stillness, when you're my son's age at 21. Yeah, that's kind of hard to do, but you know, he can meditate and be stiller. Um, <laughs> and I don't know if, if, if recognizing that he's one with God and non-dual, I don't know if that would really help him, honestly, at this juncture in his life. It, I, I kind of agree with the Taoists that it may actually confuse him more. 
I don't, I honestly don't know. I guess it's whatever. I think it's very individual. Yeah, it's whatever someone's path I, is. I started meditating when I was 19. Yeah. It really changed me. My anger, I was at Berkeley in the late 60s and so angry and radicalized in politics. And, you know, it really helped me with the anger about mm. Vietnam and everything. So it depends on the individual. Yeah. And there are also walking meditation practices too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think what you're saying is that, yes, we can wake up to all these kinds of parts of ourselves at any age, but there's something special about the late stage of life because of impending death. Mm -hmm. That's what changes it. Yeah, that's so true. I write about life completion. Mm. And what are your fantasies about a complete life? Mm. What will allow you to feel that? Mm. You know, what do you need to do or say in order to achieve that? And that's different from, you know, whether younger people should transcend or not. Mm. Because th there are there are different developmental tasks at different stages of life. Mm. You know, he's got his tasks at 21 and I have mine at 72 mm -hmm. and they're different. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it also depends on whether people are very extroverted or introverted. Mm. Some people will be called to be alone and quiet and some people will not be able to tolerate that. They get their energy from outside themselves, from other people and other in the environment and other activities, you know. So there are lots of individual differences about this. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say that the developmental tasks for this stage of life really haven't been explored. They're yeah. not, you know, in the psychology literature, I mean, there's, you know, Maslow and Erickson, and nobody has kind of gone in depth into what are the tasks of this mm -hmm. stage of life with mm -hmm. the new longevity. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what the book does. It looks at the inner obstacles Mm -hmm. And then what are the tasks to break free of those inner obstacles? Yeah, it's interesting because when um, I have been privileged enough to be able to retire early. And so when, you're re when you can retire early, it makes you really go, well, what do I really want to do with my time? If I right. can retire early, what do I want to do? And I've looked at what my girlfriends do at a comparable age and they give to nonprofits, they, um, you know, play golf, you know, a lot of my guy friends, they play golf, they start getting into like a hobby that they feel really right. passionate about. Right. This is, this is kind of the conditioned view of what it means to retire. That's right. And, and so I tried each of those things. And I thought, all of these things, I mean, a spiritual path, yes, I, I was on that before and all of this occurred. But what is actual, re what are you retiring from? And, and are these the only four choices you have? Play golf, <laughs> work for a nonprofit. I mean, I tried all of them and not one of them felt satisfying to me. And so it's, it's interesting. We, do, we don't have even um, a clear, we have this con societal view on what it means. Like you spend time with your grandchildren, you, right. hang out, you know, but but there really isn't, I mean, what's your sense of what it means or a mindset for retirement that would be more helpful? Well, you know, we've got financial planning, but we don't have emotional and spiritual planning. Mm -hmm. And so most people in our society are dis feel disoriented with retirement. And so they start to do hobbies. It's kind of a distraction mm -hmm. mm. from that from that discomfort. And sometimes there's a good fit and they love it and that's fine. But some of it is distraction. Mm. So, you know, what I'm trying to teach is that retirement is a transition 
that moves us into liminality. We're between, between worlds. Mm. That's a liminal space. Mm -hmm. We're between working and something else. Mm -hmm. And so we don't know who we are. Mm -hmm. And again, that's because we're identified with doing. Oh, wow. Interesting. So the golfing and the da 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 da, da wherever it's all those kinds of hobbies or way of distracting and being in denial that we haven't really been quiet and stops to still slow down and find out who we truly are. Well, I, we? I'm not judging people. No, no, I know. It, but yeah, that is. But I'm saying they're not going to find out the real purpose of this stage of life by playing golf. Mm. So maybe that's enough for some people. Mm. You know, there is the inner what's it called golf in the kingdom it's a book about the inner world of golf it's mm. about using golf as a consciousness it's a zen thing yeah yes it's a zen like zen in the art of archery yeah yeah but that's not how most people are doing it yes they're competing and wanting to right their friends <laughs> right right not the same yeah, it's just like transferring that same energy that you may have had in your corporate executive life to the golf course exactly. to beat your friends and get exactly. Yeah, yeah so you're in some ways missing. So they haven't be. put down the weapons of the workplace and mm. really let go into the liminality, into the uncertainty, mm. and allow the Tao to take them somewhere else mm. right mm -hmm. so that shift from role to soul can't happen if we're really distracted mm. or if we're continuing to you know kind of play the ego's game like we did in the workplace mm -hmm. and kind of live our midlife values in our 60s 70s and 80s mm. that shift can't happen under those circumstances we're not giving it attention yeah what's coming to mind for me is you know so i'm i am I'm pursuing this work about helping people unify and to reduce trauma and to recognize that a lot of our blocking and defensing and biases and dysfunction that comes in creating a workplace culture is a result of you know unhealed trauma a lot of it mm -hmm. and so I'm doing this work and I'm doing it with another friend who's in her seventies mm -hmm. and the two of us are doing this work and we've literally put hundreds of hours into this mm -hmm. seven day, 14 hour presentation. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I'm not making enough money. I'm not, you know, mm -hmm. people aren't being appreciative. How do I get these slides? Perfect. You know, all these kinds of things. Right. And again, I can see now, which I didn't see before until this very conversation about like, this isn't the work. This is not really the work you're bringing your old identity and what work meant and bringing it into this case and that's not what's needed at this stage of that's right my consciousness and my stage and what and what maybe really truly would help people as an elder um and not that i don't know maybe i i think i qualify as the elder based on the compass the combination of things that you offered but um and it's hard because it doesn't mean that i'm not working hundreds and hundreds i'm working a ton am i distracting myself I don't think so. I mean, it doesn't feel like. Well, I'm my suggestion shocking. is read the book mm -hmm. and then talk about it with your the friend, your cohort, your colleague, because you can still build this project, mm -hmm. but you can do it with an elder quality of awareness rather than a hero, midlife heroes quality of awareness. Mm. So my experience of writing this book in my 70s and publishing it and teaching is very different from mm. when I published in my 40s. Mm. And I was all full of myself. And, you know, this is a very different experience, mm. but I'm still doing it. So it's not about not doing. It's about the quality of awareness that you bring to it. Mm. how much self-care are you including in mm -hmm. your process mm -hmm. how much um unattachment to the outcome you know we could call it trusting the Tao. 
Mm. rather than pushing mm -hmm. and striving and controlling. Mm. And I would guess that your 70 year old friend will intuitively know what that's about. Mm -hmm. So how- I, can... I know already, because yeah. I do feel like, oh, right. I want this to be the perfect outcome where I score no five stars out of five stars. It's like- No perfectionism. Oh. Yeah, and, we, and we I've release, noticed a lack, yeah. We release perfectionism. Yeah, and the self care. I thought, well, look at how much you've destroyed yourself. And and it was this week where I thought, no, I'm not doing that until I meditate, I do my yoga classes, and then then I can do this. Yes. And I'm not going to sit there past like, oh, my back hurts from sitting at this desk doing PowerPoints all the time. I will get up and do a yoga stretch every yes. hour, and that's okay. I mean, those are the kinds of things yes. that. I think wisdom brings to you that yes. you can either elect to go into your old corporate mode where you're like, oh, we got to push because we're launching a product or kind of, okay, I can launch. But if I'm, if I'm not really doing and integrating what I've learned over a long period of time of increasing consciousness and where, where are you really? And living it. And living it. Walking your talk. Yeah. So, you know, CJ, well, I, I suggest that you use this project and the collaboration to walk your talk. Yeah. Because you know how to do it differently. You know, your language for it might be different from mine. Mm -hmm. but you know how to do it differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And not let your ego be in charge and not push yourself into, and keep your boundaries mm -hmm. and feel... Um, that it's your gift to the world. Do it in the spirit of service, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is very different than doing it for money or recognition. Yeah, and, and, that, and that's exactly, yeah, because I was like, you know what, I'm not making enough money. I'm like, and then I thought about, I'm like, I don't even need to make this kind right, of money. Right. So why are you doing this? And when I right. work with my clients, I think this is why I'm doing this because right. it's changing their lives and helping right. and, you know, those kinds of things. Right. So it's keeping that in the forefront, that's which right. is what my soul wants and keeping the ego. That's like, what about this? How come you're not getting recognized? How come, you know, like putting that yeah. in right. the background, it's really hard to let go of the, that, those patterns. And so it is when you talk to about the role shift, that's what, that's what it is. That's what it is. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is. Yeah, this has been so fantastic. Um, thank you for writing this book. Thank and you. This interview. I really um, appreciate it. Um, we've been talking to um, Connie, Connie Zweig about her book, The Inner Work of Age, Shifting from World to Soul. Thank you so much.